All right, joining me now are two Afghanistan war vets, Indiana Congressman Jim Banks and Pennsylvania Senate candidate Sean Parnell. Sean is also the, also the author of Outlaw Platoon. Congressman Banks, your reaction to the killing of this ISIS-K planner? Well, uh, this is a good start, uh, but it would be naive to believe that this is going to stop more attacks uh, from ISIS. You know, uh, we've been briefed now for a few years about the growing threat of ISIS-K in Afghanistan. We knew they were there all along. We knew they were building up in Kabul after, after the Trump administration uh, pushed the caliphate out of Syria and Iraq. Uh, we knew they were there. We knew that they were waiting for a moment like this and a president like Joe Biden for the right time to strike during a chaotic event. And, mm -hmm. and that's what we've seen. This, this uh, strikes uh, close to home for me, though. We just found out minutes ago that a, a, a Hoosier Marine uh, was killed uh, in the attacks yesterday, Corporal Humberto Sanchez from Logan Sport, Indiana. So this strikes close to home uh, for so many of us. We need to go out and hunt down uh, all of these ISIS uh, perpetrators of yesterday's attack and hold them accountable. And I'm glad I'm glad that one drone strike has occurred, but it's going to take a lot more than that to get it done. Sean, uh, you know about service and sacrifice in the hills of the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, the congressman just mentioned the boys we lost at that gate that we still think about, whose names we're learning now. You hear about this drone strike. Uh, it obviously doesn't make up for any of it yet. But what does it tell you about the type of response we will we will have to what happened at that checkpoint? Well, obviously, I'm glad that a terrorist is dead. But in my heart of hearts, I'm thinking, well, you know, too little, too late. It would have been mm -hmm. great had Joe Biden in this administration projected strength from the very beginning. But the fact that they did not project strength, that emboldened our enemies, it would have been great if the Biden administration ordered a drone strike on ISIS as they were escaping from these prisons. It would have been great if the Biden administration wouldn't be partnering with the Taliban, who is undoubtedly passing intelligence to ISIS, the Akani network, Hekmatyar. That undoubtedly led to the death of our troops. So I'm glad that we got a, a terrorist. I'm glad that, that uh, the world is a safer place without these people on it. But I just wish that Joe Biden would have protect, pro projected strength from the very beginning. Too little, too late is a good way to put it. You know, Congressman, we talk about the, the difference between ISIS and the Taliban. Yet we hear, as Sean alluded to, the idea that the Taliban released all these ISIS fighters. We didn't do anything about it at the time. There was a Taliban checkpoint that this suicide bomber went past before killing so many Americans. How do we differentiate? How does an average American make sense of the difference between the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, the Haqqani network, ISIS-K, and what difference does it ultimately really make as it pertains to our security? Well, it's a significant difference, uh, Pete, as you know. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, they're all terrorists, and uh, we should designate them as such. Uh, next week, we will go through on the House Armed Services Committee the markup for the annual National Defense Authorization Act, and I will be introducing an amendment that will designate the Taliban as a terrorist organization because it turns out that currently they're not. The Taliban of Pakistan is, the Haqqani Network is, but the Taliban in Afghanistan has never been designated as a terrorist organization. And you're seeing right now, I mean, they're, 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 they're complicit in the attacks that have occurred as they've, as they've taken over the country and allowed for this situation to happen. They, sh they should be held accountable. The Taliban should be held accountable for these actions as well. And one way to do that, to prevent any material support in any way, and, and further efforts to punish them for those, those activities would be to designate them as a terrorist organization. Let me tell you right now that uh, N Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, Pete, should be calling every member of Congress back to Congress tonight, tomorrow morning, go back to work. Right now, our focus has to be on getting every American safely out of Afghanistan before bl more blood is shed. And uh, not, our, our focus shouldn't be on passing fake infrastructure deals or three and a half trillion dollar yeah. socialist spending sprees. It should be doing whatever we need to do on, on, on the part of Congress to assist this administration to get every American out from behind enemy lines. As you, as you said a moment ago, if the embassy is telling Americans not to go to the airport, there's no, there's no safe way out of the country. And this administration still doesn't have a plan to get Americans out from enemy, enemy, behind enemy lines. And that's a, another complete failure on their part. I Shameful. can confirm to your point, Congressman, there, there is no way out. The gates are closed. And anyone attempting to extract people right now is finding course of action uh, 
two or three or four because that course of action is closed. But, Sean, I want to hit on something that the congressman said. He talked about designating the Taliban as a terrorist organization. That's one side of the conversation. Makes a lot of sense to a lot of us who have dealt with and understand the nature of the Taliban. At the same time, we're hearing reports from some in the State Department who would like to recognize the Taliban as the legitimate government in Afghanistan. Explain the gulf in this view, 20 years after 9-11. One side says they're still terrorists. We know exactly who they are. Uh, they, they would like to kill Americans if they could. The other one's saying, accept reality. They're the ones in control. And maybe if we, if we bestow legitimacy on them, they'll behave and we can work with them. Well, yeah, well, there'll never be a world where we can bestow legitimacy on the Taliban. Can we, I, and by the way, I reject the notion that we should mainstream them in any way. As someone who's fought against them for 485 days, believe me when I tell you they're the enemy. The Taliban are the, are the terrorist organization that gave al-Qaeda safe harbor, where they killed thousands of Americans on September 11th. For 20 years, the Taliban has been killing American troops. The Taliban were the ones that released ISIS from the prison that killed American Marines and a mm -hmm. Navy and a Navy corpsman just yesterday. And Joe Biden, believe me, look, it's a height it's a, such an insult that he's trying to mainstream them, and he would have us believe that the Taliban are sitting around in caves talking about climate change and how they can decrease their carbon footprint and, and maybe make the transfer from a Toyota Hilux pickup truck to a Toyota Prius. And they're going to treat it's the insulting. women well now. The women are going to be treated yeah, it, well. Yeah. It's insulting. It's it absolutely, absolutely insulting. I want to remind our viewers, we kicked off this hour with a brand new report that a U.S. drone strike has killed an ISIS-K planner in Nangahar province, the headquarters of where ISIS-K operates. Certainly, it sounds like one planner was killed along with an associate in a vehicle, uh, no civilian attacks in a, in a what is considered an over-the-horizon drone strike from U.S. forces. But Congressman, uh, back to you as far as what, what relationship the Taliban and ISIS-K have. That really matters to me because ultimately the next steps there, talking about the Taliban, relying on the Taliban currently for the, the, the livelihoods of 5,000 Americans at, at that airfield. Yet they have to decide how they manage or exist alongside ISIS-K. What does that relationship look like going forward? Well, it's a complicated relationship. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, the Taliban and ISIS-K have competing visions for the region, uh, the Taliban wanted to take over me, the, Break that down. the is government that, of Afghanistan. Is that, is that because you believe yeah. the Taliban is internally focused and ISIS-K is externally focused? ISIS-K wants to build the, the, their new caliphate. And, and, and again, it's, uh, the K stands for Khorasan. It's, yep. a, it's a region. It's not just the, the borders of Afghanistan, but it's an entire uh, region that they want to build the caliphate. Into. Also keep in mind that ISIS-K and the Taliban compete for fighters, ISIS-K being able to pay a lot more for the better fighters. So ISIS-K is more sophisticated, they have better technologies, and ISIS-K poses more of a direct threat to the homeland of the United States than the Taliban Why are they does. able to, Congressman, the real Taliban quick, that's very is, interesting uh, is, to me. Why are they able to, I'm curious, sincerely, why are they able to pay more? Why do they have better weapons? Would they have inherited any of the weapons that we left behind from the Afghan National Army? Talk to me about the dynamic of why they're more sophisticated. Yeah, and, and that's it. I mean, they, they have, uh, they have the, the better talent. They, they, they already have sophisticated surveillance technology. Um, ISIS-K wants to, they, they hate America. They hate Americans. They want to destroy America. Again, the Taliban, not to diminish them, but you're, you're dealing with a completely different caliber and a different goals, their, their end goals of taking over the, uh, the government of Afghanistan. Remembering, as, as Sean already said, we're, we're, we've gone back in time to September 10, 2001, uh, before, the, before the deadly attack, when Afghanistan, the, the Taliban gave safe harbor to al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups, Osama bin Laden, to plot and plan their attacks. That's what we've gone back in time to at this moment. And ISIS-K is who ultimately, we need, we're, the, while the Taliban is a terrorist organization, we need to hold them accountable. ISIS-K's designs are so much more destructive and dangerous than what we have to pay attention to in these days moving forward. And the situation that Joe Biden has created in Afghanistan has empowered ISIS-K to a degree that we haven't seen before. They're about to, we're, we're going to be hearing a lot more about ISIS-K, sadly, in the days to come. I pray and hope that I'm wrong. Uh, Pete, but ISIS-K is going to continue to build up in that region. I, I hate to say it, but I, 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 I don't believe that we've seen the worst 
of, of uh, what we're going to see in the days to come because of Joe Biden's negligence and his failure uh, creating a situation there. It's going to be very dangerous for the world uh, for a long time to come. I want to bring it back to those 5,000 boys that are at that, American boys that are at that airport right now, uh, ultimately who were attacked uh, just, just, uh, just 48 hours ago. Ultimately, does this strike make their job easier or more difficult, especially when there is threat reporting and it's not all confirmed, but we're all we're all seeing it and hearing about it, that ISIS uh, suicide bombers, uh, vehicle borne IEDs uh, could be and likely are headed in the direction of that airport where there are Taliban checkpoints that didn't work very well last time. So it, I know we're looking at the future of the terrorist threat in ISIS K and retribution for what happened. But as we look at this retrograde, uh, more better aptly described as a retreat, uh, how does this change what our troops are facing in the next three, four days as they leave? Well, I think it, I think it changes everything, Pete. It puts, it puts our troops in a far more dangerous position. In fact, you know, this administration, our generals, by the way, who for the last six months seem focused on things like critical race theory mm -hmm. and, and white rage on Capitol Hill, you know as a leader, when you're a leader in the military, there are only so many hours in the day for you to plan, for you to dedicate your life to your troops. And every moment that our generals were distracted by some frivolous political argument on Capitol Hill, they were not planning a responsible for a withdrawal from Afghanistan, and you're looking at what's happening now, our Marines, our troops, 82nd Airborne guys are at Hamid Karzai Airport in the middle of a city of 4.5 million people. They're not in a defensive position. And it just goes to show what a disastrous decision that it was to give up Bagram Air Force Base. We wouldn't be having this conversation if we still held on to Bagram Air Force Base, which, which was a defensible position. And what's what uh, I can't wrap my mind around is the Biden administration putting the lives of Americans right in the hands of the Taliban, right, where I've got sources on the ground right now. We've been working around the clock to try to get American citizens and our allies out of that country. The, the Taliban is playing Joe Biden like a fiddle. They're telling him exactly what, it, what he wants to hear. Yes, we're going to protect your people. But on the other hand, they're out there setting up more checkpoints and making it impossible for our people to get to the airport. They're hunting them down. The double they're game. beating them. They're taking passports. And and in some cases, they're shooting at them and making it impossible for, for them to get to the airport. So this is what the Taliban does. They say one thing, they do another. And it's really time for Joe Biden and his, and his administration to play hardball. I got a report just moments ago of people being pulled off of a bus, being beaten by the Taliban. It, it's happening in real time. Uh, Rep Representative, when we don't know many details about this drone strike that killed an ISIS-K planner. We're glad he's dead. We're glad his associate is dead. We don't know how significant this person truly was, uh, who was driving alone, no civilian casualties. We will hopefully learn more. Our own Lucas Tomlinson will rejoin the program as he digs for more details at the Pentagon. But when you look at the leadership at the Pentagon, the brass at the Pentagon, from, from Austin to Milley and others, how would you thus far, how would you gauge their response thus far? Not for the entire war, but looking at the last two, three weeks, how they've managed what we've done as a military in this situation. Uh, Pete, I hate, I hate to say it, but it's a, it's a shameful failure on their part. They're going to go down in history uh, as that, as, fa as failing our nation, failing our troops, failing our national security. They should be held accountable for that. But, but right now we have to be focused on how we get uh, every American safely out from behind enemy lines. And at this point, I don't have a high degree of confidence that this team can get that done. Yesterday, we, when Joe Biden appeared before cameras, yet again with scripted remarks. I had hoped that he would appear before the American people and say that he was replacing every single one of them. Yeah. And instead of doing that, he, he doubled down. And uh, as, if he continues to double down and not, and not put capable people in places that at least he will listen to, capable people in places in all of these positions that will figure out how to get every American safely out of Afghanistan, this is going to continue to get worse and worse. That, uh, that, that's, uh, that seems to be the... Uh, the, uh, the, the fact at this point, I, I, I wish that were different, but Joe Biden has proven, proven he's incompetent and unable to provide the type of leadership that America needs in this moment. You know, Sean, when you were a platoon leader in Afghanistan, every, everything stopped with you. The responsibility was with you from the lives of your men to your mission to the accountability of your equipment. Um, when you look at who's being held accountable and who should be held accountable for where we are. And again, we recognize tonight it's important that this drone strike happened and that we're 
that we're putting ISIS-K fighters in the dirt. That's a good thing. And there's a mission that's ongoing going forward. And, and we, we hope they're successful in that mission. But we can still do this at the same time, recognize what maybe could have or should have been done better. Should, is there accountability that needs to exist? Whether it's at the Pentagon or the State Department or the National Security Advisor, where do you place it? Well, of course. And I, I got to tell you, I was horrified to watch Joe Biden yesterday, who instead of taking accountability for this botched withdrawal, because you're right, the buck does stop with him. Commanders, as they tra as they train you in the military, you know, you're responsible for everything that happens or fails to happen under your command. Joe Biden owns this. But the first thing that he did was blame President Trump for this catastrophe. And, and let me remind the viewers that in seven or eight months of, of the Trump presidency, ISIS and Al Qaeda and the Taliban were decimated. They were on the ropes. In the first eight months of the Biden presidency, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, Haqqani Network, Hakmatir, they control a country. And these terrorist factions are now going to be woven into the fabric of this interim government. I couldn't have botched mm. the withdrawal in Afghanistan worse than Joe Biden if I tried. He's an absolute disaster. And the only people that have been blamed throughout all of this are the Taliban right now for not uh, conducting security good enough. I mean, Pete, you and I probably know privates who were fired for misplacing yeah. ink cartridges, <laughs> yet we have generals who botched the withdrawal of a 20-year war, seem not held accountable at all. It's so backwards and wrong, it's just hard to wrap your mind around. I've spent days in a row walking online looking at, for one weapon that was lost inside a battalion. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it's just, it's a reality of what we're up against right now. It, it, I, it, Representative Banks, I wanna ask you real quick, the, this idea that this attack on this ISIS uh, K fighter was an over the horizon capacity. As Lucas shared with us, and we're gonna have him back here shortly, uh, it took about, takes about eight hours for that flight to remain on, to, to get on station. It's got four or five hours that it can fly over the target. Uh, thankfully, the timing worked out uh, tonight, and we're glad. How capable, can, uh, how sustainable is it to believe that we could degrade the ISIS K threat from that amount of standoff going forward. Yeah, you, you can't. You, you and I, uh, Sean, all three of us know this, having, having served there, having been there uh, many times, you can't, you can't sustain it that way. This is why giving up Bagram was such a colossal mistake, why, why we gave up the position that we had before we, before we got every American uh, out of the country and we gave up uh, a, a Bagram airfield where we could, where we could have flown these types of strikes out of directly on the ground. It's not sustainable. We can't keep it up. Um, I, I'm glad that the, the strike occurred and was, a, was a, a success tonight, but it's gonna take a lot more of these types of strikes to, to eliminate the ISIS-K threat uh, to be successful moving down the road. Sean, how long is it before a lot of the on the ground sources that we've had, that we've developed, frankly, that have been central to evacuating so many of the American citizens uh, and our Afghan partners over the last few weeks? How long is it until those relationships, those intel sources ultimately run dry and aren't as effective as maybe they were in this case, where we have connections, we have intel operatives, uh, we have agents capable of cultivating sources that led to the fact that this guy's, this ISIS-K planner is dead. How long before, if we have no boots on the ground, no source or very limited sources on the ground, we start to not have the eyes and ears that we need? Well, I would say tragically 31 August. I, it, it, I think that Joe Biden is wholly committed to, to this withdrawal. I think that right now they're, they're blowing up and destroying American equipment and prep for that withdrawal. And, and my fear is because this surrender has been so botched, we, we've got allies on the ground. We even have thousands, I, I would say, of Americans still on the ground who are trapped there. And my fear is that we, we've invested 20 years of, of blood and treasure into that country, sacrificed into that country, gave them a shot at freedom. But now we're creating an entire new generation of enemy who have a reason to really dislike us because we abandoned them in their, in their hour of most desperate need. And my heart breaks for those people after, you know, 20 years of, of of sacrifice in that country, thrown away, uh, discarded in, in seven months of Joe Biden. It, it really is just a tragedy. That's the scary part of it. And I, I, I don't, know if, don't know if it's a perfect analogy, but the idea that if you're, if you're watching or look, thinking back on an NBA Finals, a seven game series, sometimes the only thing you remember is that last shot in the last 30 seconds. Exactly. And there was so exactly. much more that went into it the entire time and, and much of it has been discarded at this time. Sean Parnell, Representative Jim Banks, thank you for being so generous with your time tonight and, and perfect guest with your expertise on the ground. Thank you.